everyone. Welcome to another episode of Island Uplift's History Class. It is so good to have you today. In today's class, we will begin our look at the European rivalry that occurred in the Caribbean, and we'll specifically look in this episode at the pirates and privateers. Now, the objectives for this topic go as follows. Firstly, we will be looking at Spain's attempts to control and monopolize the Caribbean. Then we'll take a look at the rise of pirates and adventurers. Then we'll look at the rise of French and English privateers. Then we'll take a look at the Dutch revolt, which is also known as the revolt of the Netherlands. Then we'll look at the Dutch West India Company, Sir Walter Raleigh and the Wild Coast. And finally, we'll take a look at the British, Dutch and the French in the Guyanas. So let's get into it. Now on your map, and specifically within the circle, the, the purple circle there on the map, is the Iberian Peninsula. Now the Iberian Peninsula consists of two countries, Spain and Portugal. Now in the year 1493, the Treaty of Tordesillas was put in place. This treaty allowed Spain to have control of all lands west of this line that you see on your map, and it allowed Portugal to have control over all territories east of that line. Now, after the Treaty of Tordesillas, Spain adopted a policy called Mare Clausum, or the Closed Sea. Now, this referred to their policy of closing sea access by other European powers to the Americas. As a result, all foreign ships were banned from the Caribbean and from trade with the Spanish colonies. Now, here's the thing. Other European nations accepted this policy, but only in regard to the lands that the Spanish already colonized, which were Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and Trinidad, as well as the Viceroyalty of New Spain, aka what we know as Mexico. However, there were some territories that the Spanish had no settlement in. The Lesser Antilles, the Bahamas, and the Guyanas. It is within these territories that the Spanish monopoly began to be challenged. Now, first of all, we want to take a look at European religion and nationalism, which can be seen as the initial monopoly breaking factor. Now, Spain's monopoly in the Caribbean region was primarily challenged by religious developments in Europe. Now, before 1517, all European nations acknowledged the authority of the Pope and saw his importance in settling international disputes. The Pope's judgment would have been seen as having the sanctioning of God. Now, the Reformation movement then began spreading throughout Europe. The famous Christian reformist Martin Luther began preaching against the teachings of the Catholic Church, which then caused a divide in Europe between Catholic and Protestant countries. Now, while Portugal and Spain sided with the Pope's authority, countries such as France, the Netherlands, and England sided with the Protestant movement. Now, France was still Catholic, but they decided to go against papal ruling and influence. Imagine that. Now, this split caused Protestant countries to feel free to explore lands that were originally designated to Spain and Portugal by the Treaty of Tordesillas. Now, prior to the Reformation movement, some European countries already began trespassing on Spain and Portugal's monopoly, namely France and England. <laughs> now, English and French sailors initially made journeys to lands north of official Spanish settlements, such as like the Canadian shores by the English in the years 1497, 1516, and 1527, and other North American coasts by the French in the years 1524 and 1534. Now, these voyages were initially meant to build peaceful trade, but deliberate actions of this sub in Spanish and Portuguese monopoly were about to begin. It was, it's going to get serious, my people. Now, one of the things you realize is that we will mention this particular word frequently, privateering. 
So first of all, we have to understand what do we mean by privateering? Now, privateering is the act of engaging in state-sponsored piracy. State-sponsored piracy. Now, the term was coined in the 17th century to attribute a legal status for actions that were conducted by ships carrying what is known, what was known, sorry, as a letter of reprisal, also known as a letter of marquee. Now, this letter was given to a ship owner in peacetime who had been robbed by someone of a foreign country. Okay, so they're assisting in the, in the revenge action here. This letter essentially allowed that ship owner to reclaim what was stolen from him by seizing the property of anyone, not just the perpetrator, but anyone from that country. It's somewhat like a state-sponsored revenge. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, the letter of Marquis eventually became a license. Privateers could then seize and loot other ships. They would then present their loot to a price court who would authorize them to sell the loot once the loot is proven to be the belongings of an enemy nation. So let's look at some privateers and examples of privateering here. Let's look at some French privateers. Now, between the years 1494 and 1559, there was a lengthy series of conflicts going on between Spain and France, which became known as the Italian Wars. Now, the aim was for either country to capture the Italian peninsula, right there, you see it on your map there, the two arrows are pointing to it, so the aim was for either country to capture the Italian peninsula, which was at the time a series of city-states and not one unified country. Now, capturing Italy would have been seen as extremely profitable in light of its religious importance with Rome being the seat of the papacy. And with Italy also having investors and experts in shipbuilding and navigation, makes sense. It's, it's a good logistical move to capture Italy. Italy was also still a center for trade, although that was diminished heavily by the rise and presence of the Ottoman Empire and their blockade of the Eastern Mediterranean region, the Middle East, the Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea, and of course the big one, the Silk Road. Wow. Now, although the focus of these wars was on Italy, the French took the opportunity to ignore the monopoly of Spain in the Caribbean. Okay, so they're moving from Italy now to let's impact them also in the Caribbean. So French King Francis I insisted on his right to send ships, famously stating that he is not, and I quote, excluded in Adam's clause from a share of the world. <laughs> so say, listen, I am a man, you're a man. All of us are human beings. We come from Adam. Listen, we all have a share in this world. <laughs> now, French captains would sail out into the Atlantic from ports such as Brest and Bordeaux to raid Spanish ships between the Azores and Seville. These French sailors were financed by the French government, the nobility, and wealthy businessmen, and they were known as, as we discussed before, privateers. Now, in the year 1536, the Treaty of Lyons was formed between France and Portugal. Now, this required the French to promise that their captains would not operate between the Azores and the European continent in exchange for the French to use Portuguese and West African ports as shelters and harbors. Okay, then. Now, just a little reminder, remember that Portugal owns all of these settlements. Portugal has captured, well, let's not say all, but Portugal has captured many seaports and settlements across the African, the Western coast of Africa, and even into Asia. Portugal basically controls the eastern part of the globe, the eastern hemisphere, all right? Now, this agreement between the French and the Portuguese, it seemed it would have solved the privateering issue, but it did not. Instead, it escalated it. 
my lord. So French privateers, they are now beginning to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Now, despite the requirements of the Treaty of Lyon, the French privateers wanted to actually rob Spanish ships. All right. Also, they initially robbed them while they came near continental Europe towards Seville. That's a bold move. However, they soon realized that immense wealth could also be obtained if they, the French sailors, that is, made the risk to sail into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, in the year 1523, a French captain by the name of Jean Fleury captured ships that were a part of a treasure fleet that was sent by Hernan Cortes himself from Mexico to Spain. Now, Fleury was seen as one of the pioneers of privateering and piracy in general at this scale across the Atlantic Ocean. Then in the year 1537, a captain and investor named Jean Danjou, who supplied the ships for Fleury's privateering, captured nine Spanish ships within a treasure fleet that was sailing through the Florida Strait. He also raided tongues in Cuba and Hispaniola. Then, from 1552 until 1559, French Captain Francois Leclerc and his Lieutenant Jacques Sauré conducted raids in Yaguana, which is modern-day Port-au-Prince, Haiti, as well as other tongues in Hispaniola and in Santiago de Cuba and Havana. They raided Havana twice, as a matter of fact. Now, Leclerc used religion as an excuse as he had adopted Protestantism, specifically becoming a Huguenot. This made him and his crew, who were also Protestants, even more unsympathetic to the Catholic Spanish territories. It is getting hot, my people. Now, the Italian wars ended in 1559 with the signing of the peace treaty of Cato Cambrisi. As part of this treaty, lines of friendship were drawn down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and along the Tropic of Cancer. Now, these lines created a region of peace peace <laughs> over continental Europe, but they also established regions of no peace west of the Azores and south of the Tropic of Cancer. Now, the creation of these regions of peace and no peace only temporarily brought some order. However, in actuality, it helped to intensify the occurrence of piracy and privateering even more than before. Let's now look at some English privateers. Now, in the year 1527, an English captain named John Rutt made a voyage to North America. His voyage was commissioned by the English king, Henry VIII, for the purpose of searching for the Northwest Passage. Now, this passage represented a pathway to sail to the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic Ocean via the Arctic Ocean and specifically via the Canadian Archipelago Islands. Now, while on his journey, Rudd sought to trade with the Spanish to supply them with resources that they may need in exchange for gold, silver, or other resources. After his voyage, many other English captains followed suit because Spanish settlers needed slaves and manufactured goods. It really hurts my heart to, to see how they treated persons in that way, in, in, in slavery. It, it really hurts your heart. Eh? Anyway, just seeing them as commodities. It's wow. England sought to be an official supplier and trade partner, but Spain did not trust England and saw the English as interlopers. <laughs> Now, among all the English captains, the ones who are deemed to be the real pioneers of the English becoming pirates and privateers are the father-son duo of William and John Hawkins. Now, William Hawkins was an English captain who became known as the pioneer of what was called the triangular trade. Now, he developed a route of sailing to West Africa from London, picking up slaves by force or by bartering. And then he would sail towards the Caribbean where they would be sold to the Spanish in exchange for tropical produce. And then he would sail back to England. 
Now, this looks familiar because this triangular tree that William Hawkins helped to develop, it then became the primary route used in the transatlantic slave trade. Wow. His son, John Hawkins, continued this triangular trade, but in a more ruthless way than his father did. Now, John Hawkins, this is the son, John Hawkins initially tried to abide to Portuguese and Spanish rules, and he went through the process of obtaining a license wherever he traded. However, he was known as a ruthless man, using threats and force to obtain licenses or even to steal goods. However, the real breaking point was about to occur. In 1567, he was refused permission by the Spanish to trade at the town of Rio Hacca in modern-day Colombia. As a result of this refusal, John Hawkins captured the town <laughs> with 200 men and forced the inhabitants to trade with him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, Spanish authorities retaliated by destroying all but two of his ships when they found him repairing them in San Juan de Ulloa in Mexico, which is just northwest of the Yucatan Peninsula in the year 1568. Now, this event marked the official turning point in the relationship between the Spanish and the British, with the British adopting piracy and privateering. And of course, when you're looking at piracy and privateering, you have to look at this guy. Sir Francis Drake. Now, Sir Francis Drake was a British naval officer who, upon hearing of the events that occurred at San Juan de Uloa, wanted to have revenge on the Spanish. Now, under the instructions and encouragement of then British monarch Queen Elizabeth I, Drake led many raids and attacks on Spanish settlements throughout the Caribbean, firstly as a captain and then, after 1585, officially as a privateer for England. His most famous raids include Operation Isthmus, which occurred in 1572, which saw him capture hundreds of tons of silver from the Spanish that was being carried from Panama to Nombre de Dios, which was also in Panama, and the raids of Santo Domingo and Cartagena, Colombia in 1586. Now, his final raid was in the year 1595, but it turned out to be unsuccessful due to the defense mechanism that was set up in the region by Menendez. Now, remember, we spoke about Menendez. Um, for more information on him, please see episode 13, where we looked at Spanish colonization and the colonial structure. All right. Now, Drake later died of dysentery and was buried at sea off the coast of Nombre de Dios. Now, the impact of the privateers. Now, their stories of pillaging and plunder made for exciting storytelling. And it made for exciting storytelling for many British and European children at the time. This added to enhancing the morale of these European societies. And of course, in hearing of these adventures, Everybody was interested in being a part of it. They damaged relations between Spain and France before the year 1559. And they also contributed to war between England and Spain from 1585 to 1604. Another impact, their actions made the conflict between Spain and other European nations evident, as well as the disagreements between the Spanish government and settlers in the Caribbean concerning Spain preventing them from accessing cheaper goods that were produced by the British and the French. They also showed that Spain could not defend her monopoly in the Caribbean against determined attacks. However, the work of Menendez and others kept the Spanish defense alive in the region and still withstood the British and the French attacks. All right, cool. The Spanish were still doing something. So England and Spain, therefore, had to depend on piracy and private. And there's a little mistake here. It's actually supposed to be England and France. Sorry, that's a little typo on my end. Forgive me. So England and France, therefore, had to depend on piracy and privateering to gather any wealth from this region. Though some raids were successful, capturing an entire Spanish fleet or conquering an entire Spanish settlement or even capturing and settling on an island territory or any territory was seemingly virtually 
impossible. It seemed impossible until the British and the French got some help from an unlikely source, very unlikely source, the Dutch. And the Dutch were gonna change everything. So let's look at the Dutch who were seen as the principal breakers of the Spanish monopoly. Let's start by looking at the revolt of the Netherlands. Now from the year 1519, the Netherlands were considered part of the Spanish empire, a little backstory here. However, after the reformation movement, the Northern provinces of the Netherlands broke away from Catholicism and they became Protestant. Now King Philip of Spain in his efforts to win back the Netherlands to Catholicism, he sent the Duke of Alva with an army to the Netherlands, which saw the occurrence of massacres known as the Inquisition. As a result of this Inquisition, the Dutch rebelled, sparking a 40 year long series of revolts known as the Revolt of the Netherlands. Now, Queen Elizabeth I then began supporting the cause of the Dutch rebels, sending reinforcements when and where she could, and encouraging her sea captains to raid Spanish fleets carrying treasures. Spain ended up using most of their treasure to fund the war efforts in the Netherlands, which led Spain to eventual bankruptcy. Now, the northern Dutch provinces, because the southern provinces still remained Catholic, the northern Dutch provinces then became entrepreneurial, building immensely large fleets of ships. As a matter of fact, the number of ships the Dutch were able to build and have outnumbered the total number of ships from all other European countries combined. That's how passionate the Dutch were with their entrepreneurial spirit. Wow, eh? And they were able to establish their own financial institutions. By the year 1595, the Dutch formed the Dutch East India Company, which helped to break Portuguese power in the East and then in the year 1621, they formed the Dutch West India Company, which broke Spanish power in the West. Let's see exactly how they were able to do this. Now, in the year 1595, the Dutch began mining salt at Araya in Venezuela, and you can see it right there on the map. They had to do this as they were unable to get salt from southern Portugal due to their conflict with Portugal. By the year 1605, the Dutch had 10 ships that were trading salt, tobacco, and other products with Spanish settlers on a monthly basis. Now, the Spanish called for a truce between the Dutch in the year 1609, which lasted 12 years. This truce was to help curb the impact that this trade was having on their, the Spanish-owned trade. Now, during this 12-year truce, the Dutch strengthened their arsenal of ships and increased trade in the Caribbean exponentially, which became a concern to the Spanish. The Dutch also ventured east to continue their war with the Portuguese. Now, check this out. This is how serious the Dutch were about this. Before the 1600s, the Portuguese controlled many major ports in the Eastern Hemisphere, as seen um, indicated by the Portuguese flags. Now, each Portuguese flag doesn't always represent just one port. There are some places where there might be more than one port, but it does show that all of these ports, they were captured and owned technically by the Portuguese. However, the Dutch in their fight to capture the trade and ports of the Portuguese conquered most of the Portuguese ports. Look at that. There are just a few ports remaining. These are the ports that were remaining. By the year 16, by the 1620s, 1630s, Portugal had lost a lot of their ports. The only ones that were remaining were the port of Elima in Ghana, the Angolan ports, the Mozambique ports, the port of Goa in India, and Macau, which is in southern China. 
Now with this conquest, the Dutch now control, and here it is, they control the spice trade between Europe and India, as well as China and Southeast Asia. They control the trade. Now with this conquest, the Dutch now control the spice trade between Europe and India, China, and Southeast Asia. So the Dutch were rich off of this thing. And they were overcoming the Portuguese in an extremely large way. The climax of this conquest, however, came in the year 1637, when the Dutch captured Elima, Ghana, which was at the time the world's largest slaving station. Now, acquiring Elima allowed the Dutch, and, and you see the thing is the Dutch were already now in control of the spice trade, but now the Dutch were in control or they had the majority of the shares, if you want to put it like that, in the slave trade. So acquiring Elima allowed the Dutch to penetrate into the Spanish empire. You see, they had broken Portugal's monopoly in the east, as evident here, and now it was time to break Spain's monopoly in the west. Now, before the capture of Elima, the Dutch had increased their salt trade ships in the Caribbean from 10, remember they had 10, to 800 ships. What? <laughs> Now, from their main post in Araya, they began expanding their trade along the coast of the Guyanas and then to Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and of course, Jamaica. However, in the year 1605, this was before the 12-year truce, the Spanish attacked Araya, flooding the port's main lagoon, prohibiting tobacco farming, and forcing Spanish settlers to leave the area. Then in the year 1621, at the end of the 12-year truce between the Spanish and the Dutch, the Dutch established the Dutch West India Company. This was a trading and colonizing company that was set up by the states of the Dutch Republic, which had jurisdiction over Dutch territories and trade in the Americas and Africa. Now, the establishment of this company meant that trading and military posts had to be established within the territories. This led to a major conflict between the Dutch and the Portuguese, with the Dutch capturing the northeastern Brazilian territory in the year 1624. It was here in this territory, as you see indicated there, it was here that the Dutch learned about growing and processing sugarcane. Now, the Dutch then became now, the Dutch then became the first to capture entire Spanish treasure fleets, which were traveling from Honduras and Peru to Havana, Cuba. Now, you have to understand, there were persons before who were capturing ships that were part of treasure fleets. But nobody before the Dutch did it, nobody had ever been successful in capturing an entire Spanish treasure fleet. But the Dutch were able to do that. Oh my goodness, wow. And then the Dutch in further rebellion to Spain, they then supplied England and France with slaves and knowledge of sugar processing and other forms of crop production to help them, England and France, in any colonizing efforts that they may want to undertake. You see, the Dutch... They wanted to work along with these countries against Spain. So it, it can be seen that it's probably not that the Dutch were interested in establishing a monopoly. I mean, they wanted to attain wealth. They wanted to um, engage in trade. They wanted to get wealth, of course. They were entrepreneurial. So being entrepreneurial, they probably would not have a mindset of conquest. Instead, they would probably have a mindset of trade and investment. So for them, they would see uh, monopoly as not an option, but instead they want to work along. They want to be suppliers. They want to be traders. They want to gain wealth like that. And the additional fuel to the fire, they wanted to get revenge on Spain. So they were working along with the British and the French. Now, interestingly, 
the first attempt at colonization in the Caribbean region by non-Spanish nations was not done on any of the islands. Instead, the first attempt was made in the Guyanas, in an area the Spanish frequently called the Wild Coast. Now we wanna look at the colonization efforts of the British, the Dutch and the French in this area called the Wild Coast. Now in the 1580s, then Spanish governor of the island of Trinidad, Antonio de Berrio, made an unsuccessful attempt to explore the Guyanas in search of the claimed lost city of gold, also known as El Dorado. Then in 1595, English sea captain, Sir Walter Raleigh, after an unsuccessful settlement attempt in Florida in the U.S., set out with four ships in search of the city. Raleigh had firstly captured the small Spanish settlement that existed on Trinidad, and then he set out from there up the Orinoco River. Now, Raleigh spent 20 years in search of El Dorado, a search that was not sanctioned by then British monarch, King James I. Such an action led to Raleigh's execution upon his return to England. Now, a little fun fact, which is not really related to the topic, this King James I is also the same King James that authorized the, the publication of the King James Version Bible. That's just a little, um, little, I know it's not really related to the topic, but I just had to bring that in there. All right, just to give some good historical context here. The British then made three key attempts to colonize the Guyanas. Charles Lee started a settlement on the Oyapok River in the year 1604, which had to be abandoned in 1605. Robert Harcourt tried to reestablish Lee's settlement in the year 1609, but it too was abandoned in the year 1613. Finally, a third attempt was made in the year 1620, but it ended in failure. Now, the British eventually abandoned, temporarily, the settlement of the Guyanas and turned their focus elsewhere. Let's look at the Dutch colonization of the Guyanas. Now, William Uselix is seen as the pioneer behind the Dutch successfully settling the Guyanas. In fact, he was the one who proposed the idea of the Dutch West India Company. He proposed the idea of building settlements along the Guyana's many rivers, although the Dutch didn't know that the coasts were in fact more fertile. Now, Dutch governor Adrian Groenewegen then became the driving force in expanding Dutch settlements in the area and in instilling and maintaining administrative control and diplomacy with the indigenous people. He built a settlement called Kaikovral in 1613, which was a Dutch settlement which was built near to the Essequibo, Kuyuni, and Mazaruni rivers. Kaikovral was built to be a permanent settlement for growing crops, promoting craftsmanship, and maintaining good relationships with the Amerindian natives. Now, the Dutch West India Company then built another settlement, but soon had to amalgamate or join it with Groenewegen's settlement so that it could be successful. Now, after the Portuguese regained control of northeastern Brazil from the Dutch in the year 1654, the Dutch had to resort to establishing sugarcane plantations in the Guyanas since they also would have captured and controlled slave ports such as Ilima in Ghana, they were able to bring in West African people as slaves to work the plantations. Along with sugar, they produced cotton and traded dyes and tobacco. But the success was surprisingly not immense. And then the French. Just like the British, the French were in search of El Dorado. <laughs> and, and the French would have heard of the stories from Sir Walter Raleigh. Their expedition reached the Cayenne River estuary in the year 1604. This led to the establishment of the settlement known as Cayenne on an island in the estuary in the year 1643. Now, all of this, of course, 
led to the eventual establishing of British Guyana, which is modern day Guyana, Dutch Guyana, which is modern day Suriname, and the still French overseas territory of French Guyana. And this is where we come to an end of our initial look at European rivalry, specifically looking at the pirates and privateers. So we realize that Europe, other European nations besides Spain are now occupying territories in the islands. But we realize that even though the Dutch were a bit successful with their occupation of the Guyanas, the British and the French initially were struggling. But that was soon to be a thing of the past because the English and the French were now going to explore some other territories which were going to bring them immense wealth, but were also going to place them in even more direct conflict with the Spanish. So in our next episode, we'll continue our look at European rivalry, but specifically, we'll look at the establishment of the island colonies. But this has been another episode of Island Uplift's History Class. I hope to see you in the next one. But for now, class dismissed.